In those days, in those distant days, in those nights, in those distant nights, in those years, in those distant years, in those days when all things had been created, in ancient times when all things were given their place. Let's go back 4,500 years. Let's switch to the ancient Sumerian language. Let's listen to an ancient Sumerian instrument that's called the Gish Gudi. And let's think about those ancient days. Udre. Those beautiful words, that wonderful ancient sound was performed by Peter Pringle in ancient Sumerian, playing on the Gish Gudi instrument, the ancient stringed instrument, like a lyre. So how did it make you feel? There's kind of a shivery feeling about it to think about going back in time. So today we're going to move from ancient Hebrew views of death and afterlife to ancient Babylonian. And I should explain that by Babylonian, I'm talking about the old Babylon, not the new Babylon. The new Babylon that you read about in some of the books of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, the Babylon that destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BCE. That's New Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. That's probably most familiar. But we're going back to the old Babylon, the Babylon of Abraham, who in the early texts of Genesis is called Abram rather than Abraham, who lived in one of the cities of old Babylon. It's also referred to as the land of the Chaldees. And we read in the book of Genesis that Abraham and his father Terah lived in Ur, you are of the Chaldees. So let me share my screen and we'll dive into this treatment of ancient Babylonian views of death and afterlife. Here we've got a map that I think is pretty familiar to some of us. Uh, we learned this in grade school. I know I did. I hope they're still teaching it. Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Here we have the Tigris on the north and the Euphrates on the south and how they flow down into the Persian Gulf in this final mouth of the river that uh, you read about actually in the Bible. In Genesis 2, verses 10 through 14, we read about the land of the four rivers. Two of the rivers we're not sure we can identify. They might have been more tributaries. One of them is even called the Gihon. But the Tigris and Euphrates are prominently named. And remember the garden in Eden, not the garden of Eden that we talked about. Eden means a fertile plain or a delight. And so the garden is in this delightful area of Eden. Some have tried to locate it, mythologically speaking, down at the Persian Gulf, in this sort of delta area of the Persian Gulf. You can see my cursor there. Whereas others would put it up here in what we call Armenia today, 
You can see where the rivers start. So that this would actually be the area of Eden. This is where Noah in Genesis chapter six, seven, and eight finally lands on one of the mountains of a region called Ararat, which is essentially right here where I have my cursor. And it does in fact say in Genesis two, uh, verse 10, I've got it here, that the rivers flowed out. It's the verb yatsa, they went forth from Eden and flowed out. So this is probably, at least based on the description in Genesis, the more uh, likely theory up here rather than down here. And of course, if any of you have Armenian background, which some of you will have, you might know that the legends of the Armenians, both Christian and Jewish, because there were Jews who are also Armenians, and even some of the indigenous Armenian legends are that Eden was in this highland in their land around the mountains of Ararat. So that when the ark lands in Genesis, it's like Eden again. It's kind of a, a new start to Eden, which doesn't go very well, by the way. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about one particular work uh, called the Gilgamesh Epic. Um, that particular hymn that we just listened to, uh, performed by Peter Pringle, I find it very moving and stirring and also very poetic. In those days, in those distant days, in those nights, in those distant nights, it gives you a feeling. But no more than Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, where you have this very sublime creation hymn. It's unfortunate that people read it as a kind of a battleground to argue about evolution rather than just reading it aloud. If you take my translation of Genesis right here and you read Genesis 1, you'll hear the cadence of it. Remember how it begins? Not in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. But it sounds very much like this kind of feeling. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. You can feel the drama of the text. Also, another Akkadian or Babylonian text, Sumerian really, but the copy we have is in Akkadian, which is a bit later, the Enuma Elish, which is the Babylonian creation hymn, as it's sometimes called. Here's how it begins. When on high the heavens had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name. It's very much a similar idea. It's the idea that things are not in place. Things are chaotic and empty. Things are violent and confused. And in Hebrew mythology, there is a monster in the water. Her name is Rahab, and she's able to chop up all the waters. And one of the things that Elohim does in the Hebrew tradition is he chops up Rahab into pieces, or Leviathan, the sea monster, so that the seas will be calm and so that the land can emerge. And notice in the Enuma Elish, the firm ground below had not yet been called by name. When you call something by name, you're ordering it. That's part of the motif of the opening of Genesis as well. You put things in their place. Um, let me read for you uh, from another book of mine, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, which you would think would have nothing to do with what we're talking about. But actually in chapter three, I cover this in great detail. I studied with Jonathan Z. Smith, who's now passed in the 1970s at the University of Chicago, the most brilliant historian of religions of our time. He and Eliade, I guess, are kind of the towering figures. But I think Jonathan, in terms of his conceptualization of things, at least in terms of the ancient Near East and the ancient Mediterranean world, Eliade was more generic and, and more universal and global. But Smith particularly was a student and a teacher of ancient Mediterranean religions, the Hellenistic period. 
And in the opening of that chapter, I'm actually going to read a bit of it for you, uh, just right from the book, because I don't think I could say it any better. And this will be a review for you in terms of what we did last time with the Hebrew. The archaic cosmology known to us from Homer, dominant in the classical period, and reflected in various ancient Near Eastern texts, including most of the Hebrew Bible, was that of a three-storied universe. So we're gonna have that again, also in this Gilgamesh text. The earth was seen as a flat disk surrounded by water, that is chaos. Below was the underworld, Hades or Sheo, or as you're gonna see in the Babylonian tradition, the land of no return, the world of the dead the dreary and shadowy abode of the dead. So isn't it interesting, you can go from ancient Hebrew to ancient Babylonian to Homer in ancient Greek, and there's a widespread, ubiquitous, very similar view of this three-decked universe. Above was the vault of heaven, the place of the sun, moon, and stars. Still higher was heaven, dwelling of the gods. Now listen to this. There was a celebration of order, as if something had been won, a victory over chaos. So you see that in the Enuma Elish, that everything began to get called by name. Notice in Genesis, and God said, let there be light. And then he calls things. He calls the land, land. He calls the sky, sky. By naming things, you're putting them in their place. You're giving them order. You're giving them purpose. The regular seasons, the courses of the heavenly bodies, the cycles of life upon earth, as part of this order, were guaranteed by the gods. The earth was man's place, and he was at home. Remember that. Not restless, not a stranger in a strange land, but humans are at home. The earth is the place to be in this ancient view. Death, the origin of which was variously explained, and we're going to see one of the explanations today in this particular class or lecture, was seen as irreversible and thought to be a gloomy state in which a mere shadow of the former person existed in the underworld, removed from the world of light and life. So death is, it's not non-existence, you're in the underworld, and as we'll see in the Gilgamesh epic, it's described quite vividly. The gods were close at hand. Remember the ladder to heaven or the ziggurat that you could just kind of climb up and go to heaven in the book of Genesis chapter 10? They frequently make visits to earth. They deal directly with men. They appear in dreams, visions, and communicate through signs and omens. The human purpose was to serve the gods, to conform to the decreed order of society, to offer prayer and sacrifice, all was in place. The earth was the place to be. Jonathan Smith has characterized these religions as religions of etiquette. You know, there's religions of behavior. What is the proper place? What is the proper behavior for a human being on the ordered earth once everything is, quote, created, not brought out of nothing, but set in place? Now, here's a quote from him, and this is the last part I'll read. I won't read you the whole book, but I recommend it. This is a long chapter on all of these ideas. At the center of these religions were complex systems governing the re interrelationships between gods and men, individuals and the state, living men and their ancestors. Life was not a mystery. It was explained. People knew these complex systems. The entire cosmos was conceived as a vast network of relationships, each component of which, whether divine or human, must know its place and fulfill its appointed role. Through astrology, divination, and oracles, man discerned the unalterable patterns of destiny and sought to bring his world, the microcosm, into harmony with the divine cosmos, the macrocosm. So that's Jonathan Smith in my book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. I was so honored to study with him. And so let's dig into this, uh, this whole idea, and particularly the Gilgamesh epic. Here you see the map of the 
<clears throat> fertile crescent, as it's called here. And Uruk, right here, this is Sumer in general. The Akkadian Empire later kind of subsumes and takes over the Sumerian. But we're going back 3000 BCE, 2500 BCE. And Uruk is the city of Gilgamesh, the king. He's the king. Here's Ur, where Abraham came from. Abraham is called in the book of Genesis. Uh, I think I wrote it down. Genesis 14, verse 13. He's called the Hebrew. A simple definition of Hebrew would just be the a person who's crossed over or left this civilization. If you remember, he went into the land of Canaan. He was first up at Haran, which is up here in the north. It's not up on this map with his father, Tira. And then he wanders into this so-called promised land, this little strip right here that we know as the historic land of Israel later in history. And finally, Palestine under the Romans. But let's go back here. So Hebrew probably means something like fugitive or wanderer, somebody who's out of place. It's definitely a kind of societal term. It's for someone who kind of leaves something behind. So I think it does fit Abraham pretty well. And here we have Nineveh for the tablets of the Gilgamesh epic. In 1849, Austin Henry Layard, he was a British diplomat and archaeologist, was digging at Nineveh. Many of you know the name Mosul because of the Gulf War and how we became familiar with some of these cities and their modern names. That would be Nineveh anciently in Iraq. And he uncovered the Assyrian library of Ashurbanipal, who is much later, the Assyrians are from the eighth century BC. But this library written in Akkadian had texts that were copies of copies of copies, much like our Hebrew Bible, that would then go back to earlier texts. And so these are the copies we have. And one of the th texts that was found was the Enuma Elish that I read from. Uh, when on high, the heaven had not been named. Firm ground below had not been called by name is the opening of it. But also we have the Gilgamesh epic, which we just heard perform by Peter Pringle. Peter Pringle, by the way, if you go to YouTube and do a just search his name. Uh, he's all over. He has many, many beautiful videos where he recreates ancient music. Uh, you'll love it. Uh, I really recommend it. So what we call today the Gilgamesh epic is 12 clay tablets. I think I have a picture here. This is one of the tablets or one and a half of the tablets. They're written in cuneiform or Akkadian. And the clay tablets are copies of copies of copies, as I said, but they seem to date back to the time, maybe about 1,200 BC. We're not sure exactly uh, all the dates of these things, but they're telling the legendary story of the king of Uruk, Gilgamesh, the historic king. He probably is historic, but he becomes so legendary in old Babylonian or Sumerian literature that he's all over the place. He becomes a demigod of superhuman strength and so forth. This is actually an image of uh, Gilgamesh, and you can see some of his supernatural strength as he's taming these wild beasts. This is in the National Museum in Baghdad of the nation of Iraq, and there are many other things. If you ever get a chance to go, I've never been, but I would like to go. And that gives you kind of an idea of what he was like. So here's the basic story that we're going to pick up on. The Gilgamesh epic is 11 or 12 tablets, really 11 in terms of the story. We're mainly going to focus on tablet 11, where Gilgamesh goes looking for eternal life. Because we're doing death and afterlife, we're not doing all of Sumerian culture. But in the Gilgamesh epic, he is a very semi-supernatural being, a kind of demigod. He's very powerful. He's also oppressive. One of the interpretations is that he 
oppresses the people economically and socially. Another is that he sleeps with all the wives on their wedding nights before their husbands are with them. So he's a pretty randy, lustful guy in these tales. He then is sent in Kidu, a wild man created by Anu to oppose him. And they fight and we get all kinds of tales about their struggles and they become very close friends. And so Enkidu and Gilgamesh team up and they do all sorts of great exploits. So, you know, the Gilgamesh epic is full of adventures and stories of all kinds of things that happen. One of the things they do is kill the bull of heaven. And then the gods decree that one of them should die. And it's decided that Enkidu would be the one to die. And he begins to become sick. And he has this horrifying dream of the underworld in which he sees what it's really like to go down into the underworld. Now, this is not quite the view of Sheol that we saw in the Hebrew Bible, but it still is the idea of where the dead go and where they end up. It is called the land of no return. Kurnurgia, Kur is dirt or ground. So once again, you have this association with the ground or with dirt. And finally, Enkidu dies. Gilgamesh is inconsolable. He weeps and he cries. And for seven days, he watches the body, I think, hoping that it might come back. Finally, he sees a worm crawl out of the nose of Enkidu, and he knows it's hopeless. Remember, womb to tomb. Some people have even said sperm to worm in terms of kind of talking about human fate, how we began as a small seed in our mother's womb and end up with the worms in a tomb. Uh, the poetry is grim, but maybe kind of ingenious in English. Gilgamesh then undertakes a kind of a cosmic journey, not to the heavens, but in a horizontal way, although he goes through various kinds of cosmic passages, but he's not literally going up to heaven. His goal is to reach an island that's way out in a, beyond an ocean that is uninhabited except for this island. And there's the hero of the Babylonian flood. When these texts were first uh, published and studied, in the late 19th century, you can imagine the stir that they caused, because not only did you have a flood legend that would be somewhat parallel to the book of Genesis, but you had this creation hymn, Enuma Elish. And now, as we're going to see, the adventures of Gilgamesh, they don't exactly parallel Adam and Eve in the garden in Eden, but there is this idea of missing out on eternal life. And that's what we want to focus on in this particular session that we're doing on ancient Babylonian views of death and afterlife. So Gilgamesh starts out to find this uh, Babylonian Noah. His name is Unapishtim, and he with his wife live on this island, and they live forever. They have immortality. So they are somehow beyond the normal world, the inhabited world, the land that is prepared for humans to dwell in the underworld. So he makes this extended journey, many harrowing obstacles. Part of the epic are the adventures of Gilgamesh and all that he encounters. Reminds you of some of the modern children's movies and even the older children's cartoons. And I'm sure there's been one about Gilgamesh in which you fight monsters and wrestle all kinds of uh, creatures and you're triumphant and you're strong and so forth. He finally is able to come to the island. There's a ferryman who takes him across and he lands on the island. And in Kidu's dream of the house of the dead, I put here, in from tablet seven, verse four, where you get an idea of why he's so desperate to reach this island. Here's his dream. 
It's called the house of the dead. The house where the dead dwell in total darkness, where they drink dirt and eat stone, where they wear feathers like birds, where no light ever evades their everlasting darkness, where the door and the lock of hell is coated with thick dust. I left that word hell. This is the old translation. I think it's Pritchard in his ancient Near Eastern textual book. And the reason I left it is to make the point I made last time that hell originally, even in Old English, like in the King James, just means a hole. So in other words, the underworld, the ground, under the ground, the what the Hebrews would call Sheol. So the lock of Sheol, if we were speaking Hebrew, the lock of the pit is coated with thick dust. So nobody's opening and shutting the lock and coming back and forth from the underworld. And here's what Enkidu says. When I entered the house of dust, on every side the crowns of kings were heaped, on every side the voices of the kings who wore those crowns, who now only serve food to the gods. Because there are deities down there in the Babylonian view. It's much more populated than the Hebrew view. But you get this very similar idea. On the road from which there is no way back, remember, Kernergia, the land of no return, to the house where the dwellers are bereft of light, where dust is their fare and clay their food. I want to go back to the slide that I gave in the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew view of death and afterlife. Remember Job, a very old text, when Job is lamenting his life and his suffering, and he says, I wish I just died at birth like a miscarriage, but like an infant in the womb that never sees the light. But look at how he describes it in the place I have underlined here. There the wicked cease from troubling. There, there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. This maybe is not as mythologically described with, you know, eating dirt and stone and you wear feathers like birds. So it's sort of a grotesque idea that you're sort of a bird of prey, prey and your main purpose is to serve food to the gods. But you still get this parallel that the crowns of kings are heaped and on every side, the voices of the kings. And here also you have the small and the great, the weary, the ones who ruled, as well as uh, those who were slaves that are free from their master. Now, on the way, before he reaches Unapish team on the island, there's this climactic scene where he goes into a restaurant, we'd call it, or an inn, a bar, really, for refreshment. Here you see a beautiful portrayal of Siduri, the barmaid, talking to Gilgamesh. And you got to almost picture him at the bar. He wants a drink. And Sidiru says, uh, what are you doing? Uh, what are you trying to find? And here's what we have in tablet 10, line 3 or section 3. Because she rebukes him, she gives him some advice here. This is so important to get this ancient Near Eastern, ancient Babylonian. This is also the ancient Hebrew view of death and afterlife, very in a very similar way. Gilgamesh, where do you roam? The life you pursue you will not find. When the gods created humankind, death for humankind they set aside, life in their own hand retaining, O oh, Gilgamesh, let your belly be full. Make merry day and night. Make each day a feast of rejoicing. Day and night dance and play. This kind of idea is often put down to a sort of uh, Epicureanism or something, as if the Epicureans, these are the later Greek philosophers we'll talk about later, who said that, look, when you die, you die, and it's over. And this is basically very similar to this kind of view. So remember the phrase that the Apostle Paul quotes, if there's no if there's no coming back from the world of the dead, from Sheol or from Hades, then let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
But this is not really the idea of eat, drink, and be merry in some kind of uh, dissipated way. It's actually the idea of smell the roses, of live the life that you have, enjoy the light, uh, play your role in life. And why are you seeking this unobtainable goal? You're not going to find it. The gods are not going to give you eternal life. Now, let me go back to Adam and Eve. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means they come of age. And when they come of age and they're no longer children, naked and unashamed, and God puts clothing on them, but because they've eaten the fruit of the knowledge or experience of good and evil, they're put out of Eden. They go outside the gates of Eden. And outside the gates of Eden, you begin to get human choice and you begin to get the world. What's the first thing that happens after the expulsion from Eden? Cain becomes jealous of his brother Abel and kills him. And so you get the shedding of blood in the book of Genesis chronicles all those early days. But back to Gilgamesh. You can see here that her advice, Sidur's advice, is just go back and live your life. Rejoice in your accomplishments. You're not going to find eternal life. Anyway, he does arrive at the island. Here he's being met by Udnapish team, and his wife is also on the island. And Gilgamesh tells him, why he's there. I've come to find out how is it that you live forever on this island way beyond the seas, and I want the secret. So Utnapish team decides to give him some tests. I'll tell you about two of the tests. I think there are three or four, as I recall. One of them is, okay, Gilgamesh, you want to be a god. You need to prove yourself. I want you to stay awake seven days and seven nights. And he tries it. Think about it. The gods don't sleep. Humans sleep. So it's talking about the vulnerability of a human being. We can, we get tired and we get weary and we bleed and we die and we go to the underworld. We're not gods. That's the universal view in the ancient Near East. So what happens? He falls asleep. And every day, Udnapish team's wife bakes bread. So when he wakes up, you can see the seven loaves of bread that prove to him how long he's been asleep. Another test, which is the main test, he tells him the secret. He says there's a plant at the bottom of the sea. And if you're able to hold your breath and dive down or go down like a deep sea diver to the bottom and find that plant and bring it back up and you eat of that plant, you will live forever. Can you imagine when this text was discovered in the 19th century, how people would read that in that phrase that you'll eat it and live forever? And then they thought of Genesis and also the flood story and all these other parallels. It was amazing. And some of the more skeptical people said, see, the Hebrew Bible is simply copying these uh, ancient tales of the Sumerians. And of course, those defending the inspiration of the Bible. And by the way, uh, Lanyard, who discovered it, his whole purpose in digging at Nineveh, I would call him an archaeologist in uh, scare quotes, because he's basically a hunter, hunter of treasures, and he did find some treasures. But his purpose was to prove the Bible. Lots of the 19th century explorations of the ancient Near East and the Holy Land were by people who carried Bibles in one hand and the pick and the spade in the other, wanting to prove the Bible is true, that there was a flood, that these things exist, uh, that Ur of the Chaldees could be excavated and so forth. So anyway, uh, the parallels are amazing. So what happens? Well, he fits himself out with some weights. You see in this illustration, he's able to go down below the water and he is able to find the plant. 
and he takes the plant and he brings it back up with him. So he's successful. But then he falls asleep because he's so tired from this super Herculean effort of bringing back the plant. And a snake comes along and eats the plant. Is that not amazing? So once again, people are thinking, wow, a snake, eternal life, eating a plant, living forever. These parallels are astounding they're amazing but what we're really finding is the widespread culture of the ancient near east that's reflected in these ancient akkadian texts that go back to ancient sumer or old babylon as well as texts that show up in the hebrew bible in particular in genesis 2 and 3 which is the second creation story that is the one that's somewhat parallel to this. So it's not the same story, but the motifs are very similar. So what is the idea of the ancient Babylonian concept of death and afterlife? You go to the land of no return, Kernergia, and there you stay. It's more active than it is in the Hebrew view. Remember in the Hebrew view, it's silent and you lie down and you're at rest, which could almost seem somewhat positive. You know, we have that phrase, rest in peace. You also have sleep in the dust, at rest, like in the book of Job. But still, the heavens belong to gods, the earth belongs to humans, and the world of the dead is below. And people don't come up from the world of the dead, certainly not in the Hebrew Bible, except in a seance, in one of the stories we'll cover later. So I hope that gives you an idea. I want you to think about some of the parallels. And next we're gonna go to Homer in the ancient Greeks. And amazingly enough, we're gonna find some very similar ideas about this tripartite structure of reality of the cosmos and what is the human place therein. So I look forward to continuing to delve into this uh, intellectual adventure with you. Thank you. Take care.